them once we're back on land. Yeah. And okay. otherwise, yeah, sleeping is a big one, eating, watching the sunset. Yes, we try and catch the sunset. <laughs> a lot of bird watching if you can. Yep. <laughs> we do have a gym on board, so try and get some exercise if you can fit it in too, uh, as long as the seas aren't too big. What else do we do? Did I miss anything? Uh, we have a bit of data product production uh, we have to do. Uh, so we're, we d write dive reports that summarize kind of the observations of the dive in a narrative. Um, we're also making sure all of our uh, sample data entries are correct and up to date. Uh, sometimes there's some quality control things to kind of update to make sure that the products that we send out are high quality. Uh, what else? Do you have a team of science communication fellows on here? This is what I am on this ship. Um, and we do lots of ship to shore interactions throughout the day as well. Um, so when we're not on watch, we are often streaming into classrooms really around the globe. Um, so sometimes we're streaming into kindergarten classes all the way up to university students. And we teach them about the ship and the different tools we use for exploration. And we share what we've been seeing on this expedition, which is a really fun way to connect um, to different teachers and classrooms and try and inspire people to get excited about the ocean, teach them about different STEM careers um, or different pathways that could lead them to the ocean sciences, ocean exploration, and um, whatever it is they're interested in. So that's a really fun part of this ship too. Um, and we often bring in other roles to sit in on those interactions with us as well. Move is in. <laughs> so Steve, we have a question for you okay, about how we determine is. the location of the waypoints that we use um, as we're exploring. Yeah, uh, great question. Um, so the first step to planning a dive uh, and planning it well is having a really good map. Um, and so we have those products available to us. Uh, fortunately for us, we've had a um, very large portion of this area already mapped. So we have good maps in hand where we can dive, uh, rather draw uh, tracts of how we were, how we want the vehicle to go up the slope, up the seamount, what kind of features may we might want to see along the ma map before we even put the vehicles in the water. So much like you might be, you know, drawing a road road trip map you know uh, you can take out a map put a line on the map up, a cup up the contours you want to look at uh, so if you're interested in a particular ridge on a particular side you can do that um, or if there's an interesting peak you want to look at we can go over there but we draw a fairly continuous line from the starting depth we want to start at in this case it's been about a little bit over 3,000 meters down to 4,000 meters maximum uh, up to the summit of the seamount and then all along those um, all along those lines you'll have various different waypoints that you might want to interact with in certain ways so for example you know if it's a straight line you might have a few waypoints whereas if there's a turn coming up you know you might put instructions at that waypoint you know turn and go up slope uh, or if there's um, a downslope portion for example we can go provide instructions that say, okay, now, you know, we don't want to go down slope here, so we're going to just jump from a point A to B in the midwater, which is what we did last night. And it helps us navigate around the seafloor environment a little bit easier. Thank you. If you're looking at the quad channel two on satellite feed three, you can see kind of these maps that Steve was talking about. There's different identified waypoints on there and those different kind of contours or ridge lines as well. So we often have that up as we're exploring for you to see at home.
for those of you who may just be joining us. Um, we are currently descending our ROVs. This is the fourth dive of our expedition. We are currently a couple hundred, well, just under a couple hundred miles west of the Hawaiian Islands. And on this dive, we will be exploring the flank of an unnamed seamount. This will be Seamount D. Um, it's the fourth seamount that we'll be exploring so far. And similar to the way we've explored in the previous three dives, we're going to be exploring up about a six kilometer transect moving upslope, and we're going to start at about 3,500 meters depth and work our way to the summit that is at approximately 1,700 meters depth. So we'll follow a ridge along that flank, and again, similar to our earlier dives, we're looking to understand the geologic history of these deep sea mounts, we'll probably be collecting some rocks, and then looking at the different corals, sponges, and different marine organisms um, that use these so thanks for joining us. This dive will be about 24 hours again, and we are making our way down. I don't, we're at about 2,500 meters now, Hercules it looks like, so we're making our way. Is there a change in on bottom depth with the new waypoint? Um, it's going to be about 50 meters deeper, so we'll be landing at 3,600 meters rather than Three five five zero or thirty five hundred and fifty meters. Got it. Israel Nash. You don't think what? That would be amazing. Yes. I think we should go skiing together in Colorado. <laughs>
We've got a viewer wondering if we think the live aspect of these explorations makes it more enjoyable or fulfilling for us. We've got people have different answers, but I think it makes it feel a lot more real because <laughs> sometimes it doesn't feel like real life in this control van. But I think it's really fun to have uh, this live conversation. For me, I get to sit next to Steve and learn <laughs> all this incredible um, marine biology and geology. Um, and it's fun to see all the questions come in. We have a lot of people following along. Uh, who are excited to listen in. Um, just having you all say hi or ask us questions, I think really adds to the fun of the dive. Steve, what do you think? Does it I, make it more enjoyable? <laughs> I, I do like the live aspect of it. I'm, I'm a consumer uh, of it when I'm not on the ship, um, not just this platform, but others. Um, I really like the, especially on seamounts, you never know what you're gonna come across. Um, and that kind of keeps you coming back and that you're seeing it at a home at the same time that we're seeing it is pretty unique. Um, you know, I've done a lot of science at sea where we haven't had access to telepresence and, um, you know, a lot of the scientists get excited, but that's kind of where it stops for a while. And then they write a paper about it and then, you know, it might you know, aspects of it might get out in a blog or something like that after the fact. Um, but to have this kind of thing in real time is pretty special. It's neat to see how many viewers have been following along for a long time, too. Um, and we have viewers who write in from all around the globe. And I think that's just a good reminder that we're all on the same planet. And this is kind of our one ocean, too, to understand together. And I, I love that element of that, that we're all kind of invested in this kind of understanding this ocean that we still don't know that much about. Um, so I, I love that element. And yeah, I like to have it on in the background at home too. Yep. <laughs> Throw on a blue water dive for some calming and relaxation or occasionally good stories. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'll sometimes hop on the science chat, um, you know, provide feedback depending on what kind of cruise is going on. You know, it's always appreciated. We always appreciate our scientists ashore too. They take a lot of time out of their day to tune in and provide feedback. So it's we have that whole other contingent who is providing like hard data for us to include and improve the products that we produce. The only problem I have at home is that I don't have enough monitors to run all of them simultaneously. <laughs> yeah, in more screens. You don't have your own control van with massive yeah, screens I'm, to I'm do Yeah, I'm working all. on it. <laughs> uh, I had to get creative with my COVID lab at home. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm seeing from a lot of viewers that they love the live aspect of this, which is great. Um, some people saying it makes the scientific research feel so much more real. And I totally agree with that. Oftentimes, we don't really understand how research is done. We can be really removed from it, so you can read articles about it. But um, to be here and be kind of see the actual sampling and how that's done, and then you can you know watch our scientists in the lab after, um, I think gives a lot of people some insight into how this specific type of research can be done. All right, we're at 2,700 meters, getting there, a lot of blue water. And we're getting closer to our new waypoint. Hey. New launch site. Kate, what's, what's your estimate on how long you think it'll take till we get to the bottom? 34 minutes. 34 minutes, okay. We can do it. Yes, on both.
Yeah, but we're, we'll be stopped in the next five minutes, so we'll catch up. No, that's false. It's just, that's a good point. We're bouncing around. So let's pull up the, uh, Gabby, question for you about ascent and descent. Um, in terms of Hercules piloting, is this just on autopilot, or what are you doing during this time? Do you need to be super involved? I need to be super paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't need to do very much, but I need to make sure that nothing goes wrong. Um, so on descent, um, the winch speed is sort of the is the bottleneck. We want to run the winch at about 30 meters a minute, so I need to make sure the vehicle stays at 30 meters a minute, which is kind of a little fiddlier than you'd think, um, trying to keep Herc exactly to pace with Argus. So I get their, I get their relative speeds fine-tuned, and I get their headings fine-tuned so that they stay um, facing opposite directions and stretched out so there's no chance for like hockles and twists in the tether. Um, and then I just watch to make sure that nothing changes. Um, and it's and on the way up, it's sort of the same thing in reverse, um, except that Herc is sort of the speed bottleneck. We go up about half the speed we go down. Um, and so we sort of, uh, I drive Herc up as go fast ahead. as possible, and then Argus tries to keep up. Thank you. Yeah, and then the rest is just making sure nothing gets twisty or weird. <laughs> Copy. Um, you can stop even farther behind the waypoint, so give it 100 meters. Yeah, that's good. Actually... There's no way we're still right here. No. Yeah. Yeah. Not at all. <laughs> it's weird that we're getting hits, but yeah, and that they're all in that place. Oh, wait till we settle out. We're just going back and forth on our pins. so weird like a little bit confused yeah go ahead Got someone wondering if the Nautilus will be coming into Canadian waters in the near future. And the answer is probably not in the near future. Um, for the next couple of years, we're going to continue exploring out in this part of the Pacific. 
Um, we'll be keeping Nautilus in the port of Honolulu. Um, but we were in Canadian waters earlier this year um, for the Ocean Networks Canada cruise. That was in August going into September. Um, and I think, Josh, you were on you were expedition lead on that, correct? I was, yep. So we were, we've been in Canadian waters. Um, how long have we been doing those cruises, Josh? Uh, yeah, since 2015, I think we did them every year except one, I okay. think, up until uh, this year. Yeah, so we've we've been there for the last bit of while, but um, 2022 expedition will probably not be entering those waters. Kiting up for some reason. Having a hard time coming down. Should be slowing down though, right? Oh, okay. I'm not kiting up. Argus is coming down. That's what's happening. How fast did he make that move? A nine and a half. How far away is that? Two hundred meters? Oh, they're two hundred meter scores. So two, four, so it's like almost five hundred meters? Eh, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, but we were going we were going down at thirty and then he drove a knot and a half, so until he stops so we won't really start to swing that hard. It's possible. It's for two or almost three kilometers down there. So the six eight doesn't seem outrageous on the wire cam. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't totally I don't totally not believe that. Not the wraps, just that the the unwire cam. Like it's not like it's you know it's not like it's at a some we can still see it. It's not like at a crazy angle like away from the ship or whatever. When we do toes, I watch that camera more than normal ops, just because I like to see the see where it is relative to the ship. Yesterday I went had a look at it after our watch, and it was pretty close. It was pretty close to the back of the ship. Yeah. Then we were backing down on it. So it was like, yeah. I just wanted to get a sense in my head about what I see in the camera, what the actually reality is, because sometimes it's, the perspective is a little different.
All right, I've got another ROE question if you guys are available. Yeah. Bring why, it. <laughs> why do we use two ROEs instead of one? That's a good question. That is a great question. <laughs> you don't have to use two. You do it, Josh. I mean, well, I mean, it's... That's a great Josh one. It's more, I think, uh, part of how these systems were developed through through kind of hooey and and how they just kind of chose to operate you know so <clears throat> there's many different ways that you can deploy rov systems um in this particular case we we're using argus as kind of a depressor weight so it's heavy in water and it holds the main armored umbilical or the the 6-8 cables, the armored umbilical that comes from the ship. So that's the long cable that t gets us down to the seafloor. Um, and Argus's kind of main job is just to be heavy and hold the cable down. So for instance, this is a good example of exactly what we're doing right now. We decided to tow over to a different spot kind of quickly. And so because Argus is heavy, it's going to pull the cable through the water. You can imagine, so this cable is 0.68 of an inch in diameter. And we currently have almost 3,200 meters of that in the water. So you figure out that surface area, and we have to pull all of that through the water. Uh, and so Argus essentially tries to always hang below the back of the ship. And so it's always pulling the cable and managing that for us. And so in this case, when you do that, you can use an ROV that kind of is like essentially like not sort of underpowered. Like, it only has 20 horsepower. But it still feels like a sports car, relatively. It feels like a sports car, because all it has to do is pull around 30 meters of that yellow cable. It doesn't have to manage any of that other stuff. And so it flies super awesome. We can be stable. And we're decoupled from the, the ship's motion, which is why Argus goes up and down and Herc doesn't. Um, so we put those two systems relatively close to one another. We can dive to, you know, three, 4,000 meters, and Herc acts the same as he would in 100 meters uh, because of those, that two-body type system. And so there's various ways that you can deal with that uh, decoupling, um, and you can do that with single-bodied systems, so where that armored umbilical is connected directly to the ROV. You can use uh, floats, in a way, on the cable to create what's called like a catenary with the cable, and that decouples. But then the ROV tends to have to be a little more powerful because you have to it has to pull a cable. You can get pulled on a little more. Um, but then you don't have to deal with kind of some of these tensions that we see with our system. So there's kind of like give and take as to what you decide to choose. But I think historically, the reason OET runs a two-body system is just because that's kind of the how they've always done things. You know, and that's kind of how it developed and it works. We get, and the other thing with the two-body system is you get these, you get these awesome views from Argus looking at, you get this third person view of Hercules, which is pretty unique. And uh, we can provide those like stunning, you know, shots from Argus looking at her do its job. And um, I think that's pretty special. And I think that really adds to the, to what you guys were talking about earlier, it really adds to the, to the realness of it. You know, it allows our viewers to kind of really see what's going on whereas if you're just have a single body rov and you're streaming just the one that kind of first person view from just the cameras on the one vehicle you sort of lose that bigger overall perspective and i think that's where you know argus getting those shots of hercules working is really cool and then from a scientific perspective especially geology wise i've always found that argus you gives you like the bigger perspective when you're looking focus in this tiny little rock or whatever then you can kind of see kind of more of the geological features in and around the area that we're working kind of provide some perspective there as well. So there's definitely pros and cons to both, but uh, I don't know. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, that was great. I agree. Some of the Argus shots are so incredible. Even like on this cruise, a few of the times when we've been in really steep areas, if you're just looking at the you don't really see it. Um, and then you get this like very cool, just like watching Hercules essentially looks like it's, you know, floating up. Um, but I do think that really adds to it. We often show those photos when we're trying to describe to different classrooms when we stream in. 
um, and really give them a good handle of what this looks like in those Argus shots. Um, yeah, they're really often, helpful to like describe how Hercules works too. Yeah, and they're often those are the highlight photos you see, you know, from the from a season. You know, they're usually the Argus shots. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes Argus doesn't get enough love. I think. Well, I'll tell you, it's Dr. Beller's favorite camera. <laughs> That's the one he prefers the most. All right, 3,300 meters, getting closer to our target depth. I think USB was right. How fast is how fast is thirty meters per minute in knots? <laughs> let's ask let's ask Google. Thirty meters per minute is basically one knot. One knot. So we just kept going down and just paid all the, almost the same pace. So they just stayed put. It makes sense. I mean, you know, I think it's totally fine. Nothing wrong. Nothing to see here. <laughs> Someone's on vacation.
Yeah, we're just, I think we're just going to come at 200 meters right now. But yeah, we could stop at, uh, maybe we'll stop at 100 meters up. I think it's enough. Yeah. Or do you want to do 150? And we're going to be about 3,600, they said. So maybe I'll stop at 3,550 on here. You don't want to do the pendulum like into the bottom. You don't want a pendulum into the bottom. <laughs> Probably a good call. You need to unmute though. Okay, come on, I'll stop. Just starting to see the bottom there, 200. Just gonna do a quick gauge check while we settle. We're 200 meters off bottom. Yep. Oh yeah, it's doing that weird thing again. Okay, if I'm at 3550 and the bottom is 200 meters away, that means it's at 37. Still swinging? Yeah, but uh, the bottom is at 3750. Um, so we can probably come down a bit more. Uh, just because if it's, two, it's 200 meters away. Sure. Let's, yeah, let's keep coming down. Do a hundred meters, I'll go to thirty six fifty. Yeah, sounds great. We're definitely still swinging, but yeah, we won't pendulum into the bottom at this rate. Um, I'm okay with it, it's not giving me a ton of great information right now, anyways. I'm getting what I need from the butt cams mostly right now.
You should, you can flick your uh, DVL back on. It's not on right now. Okay, can you mute your mic? Thanks. There's your 3650 on the winch. Okay, I'll stop. Okay. Let me just switch through this quickly here. For those of you who may just be joining us, we are approaching bottom. We've been descending our ROVs for I think it's just over two hours now. Um, so we will get to the seafloor pretty soon. We're going to be exploring the flank of an unnamed seamount. This dive we're looking at Seamount D, um, and we will be looking to better understand the geology of this area, as well as characterizing um, this habitat in terms of the different organisms that live down here um, and call this part of the ocean home. Um, so hopefully we'll be down to the um, sea soon. Josh, do you know why, um, even though I have four beams, I'm not seeing an altitude? Nope. Okay. Once they get that running again, I'll ask them. You can look in your, uh, look at the sensors display. See what you see over there. Got it there. Altitude is 90, 91. Okay. Maybe uh, we have to change like master position or something like that. That seems weird though. Shouldn't, if it's showing up in the sensors, it should show up there, I think. You want to try and set yep. up? As soon as you're done, uh, yeah, I guess we can set up here and then. Um, actually, uh, let's let's keep going down just as it is because we are still swinging and this is a very easy way okay. to swing. Sure. Are you going down? Yep. Go for it. Now that I can look at altitude and everything, I think we just go down. Love this because now I don't have to wait for that display. I can watch this one come in at 20 hertz and my speed just starts immediately. Yeah. Oh, it's awesome. It's awesome.
don't know. Do we need to restart the GUI or the top side or something? Like, I don't know why it's not going through. I don't know. It's showing up there, Doppler. Is it showing up on... Uh, ch -ch -ch. No, it's not showing up on Grafana either. I wonder if we need to, like... You could try just doing the GUI, maybe? Or do you have, yeah, to, do, I you might, have to do the whole thing? I've... I you could, could try to start with, that's an easy first step anyway. And then yeah, let's, once we get like sorted out on the bottom, I guess we can mess with that. That does seem like a topside thing, though. Yeah, it does. Because they've got DVL going into here. Yeah. So where we are is pretty flat, so we can go, you know, pretty close to the bottom, even sure. to the point where, like, I can see the bottom and then I sort out. Argus in 65. Roger. deep here uh can you just slow down a little sure. bit yep. got our, i'll stop there i got argus in 42. okay sounds great I'm not getting your altitude over here either. Okay. Okay. Well, I guess I'll start to come underneath here and sort out. You got your altitude at 30. Yep. Pretty shy on nav right now. Who needs nav? <laughs> I'm almost there. I'm getting pulled on pretty hard right now. You are? Yeah. Um, I'm just coming into Fishai. Yeah. Argus is fighting for some reason to spin. Yeah. Oh, um, you don't have your thrusters enabled. was ready at him on <laughs> <laughs> I've done that so many times classic Argus move <laughs> <laughs> 